evening, everyone. Now, if well, we are sensitive enough to confirm God's grace, we will surely find reasons to give praise to God. But the thing about us sinners is we must learn. Learn to praise God. And why do I say we need to learn? Because by nature, we are grumblers. By nature, we tend to look at things that we are not satisfied with more than uh, we can find things to give thanks for. And by nature, we tend to complain more than we praise. So you just ask yourself, I mean, what is the latest attitude or the words on your mouth? Is it praise or is it complain? And so it's not difficult for us to notice that, you know, it's so easy for us to spot things we do not like, but it's so difficult for us to appreciate the common grace that God has given us in our life. And so not just us, we know that the Israelites that we have been reading in the book of Exodus, usually what we know the Israelites for are that they are a bunch of what? They are a bunch of grumblers. But today we will read a different side of the Israelites after God has uh, help them cross the Red Sea and God has drowned all their enemies. And so today, when we continue to uh, Exodus chapter 15, while we go through this contents of Exodus 15, you may feel like eh, the contents of chapter 15 seems to be about the same as chapter 14 because it's recapping. But uh, chapter 14, if you still recall, uh, we talk about how God led the Israelites cross the Red Sea, and drown all their enemies, the Egyptians. So while today we talk about the same event, but slightly different, because in chapter 15, it describes the reaction of the Israelites to what God has done. So chapter 14 tells us what God had done, the event, the Red Sea, and the drowning. But chapter 15, it talks about the Israelites praising God. So here we go on to read Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to who? They sang this song to who? So pay attention. They sang the song to the Lord. And Moses said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has heard into the sea. And the Lord is my strength and my defense. So this defense in the original Hebrew is actually also translated as song. So in other words, Moses is saying, the Lord is my song. Or rather, the Lord gives me song. The Lord is my joy. The, the Lord gives me reason to rejoice. And the, he has become my salvation. Of course, when the Israelites, they are singing this hymn, they are referring to the Red Sea. But as we read as New Testament believers, I believe we all recall you know, how Jesus has become for us a sin offering so that we can be redeemed. And so he has become my salvation. And he is my God. I will praise him. My father's God. Now, this is my father's God. Maybe you don't think anything's interesting about my father's God. But when Moses said, not just my God, but my father's God, he's actually referring to God's faithfulness as a faithful covenant keeper. Because when Moses talked about God helping the Israelites, Moses is making reference all the way to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph, about how God has been faithful to the, his own people, his elected ones, from Abraham's time all the way until Moses' own time. So my father's God. God is a faithful covenant-keeping God. And then I will exhort him. And verse 3, The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has heard into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them and they sank to the depths like a stone. I don't know when you read this, uh, do you uh, see any connection between how God is taking revenge on his enemies? Because if you recall, the Pharaoh right from the beginning in the book of Exodus, the Pharaoh wanted to drown all the Israelite male infants. And so right now what happens is God was the one to hurl the Egyptian army into the sea. And verse 6, your right hand, Lord, was majest majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you, and you unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. And by the blast of your nostril, the waters pile up. Now, as you read all this, you may think it's very poetic. It's just very descriptive. But if you think about the, the words being used to describe, it's actually quite interesting because you know, now talk about the, the blast from God's nostril. You know, someone ever made this very interesting observation that, you know, have you ever seen anyone 
blowing out the birthday candle with using the nose. I mean, besides it being very disgusting, you don't know what flow out besides the air. And but besides that, the air from the the strength of the air from the nose is actually lesser than the strength of the air from the mouth, right? But here, the interesting part is the. The, according to the song, the descriptive song, Moses is trying to say, you know, God just needs to use a little bit of his strength from his nostril and the waters can pile up, he can save his people, he can kill all his enemies. And because, and okay, we read on, okay, the waters pile up and the surging waters stood up like a wall and the deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. So of course, God is the creator of all things. So naturally, the water you have to listen to God's commands. And verse 9, look at this. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, and I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword, and my hand will destroy them. So this is trying to make a joke out of God's enemies. Because us, we have really known the final outcome. And we know that Egypt, uh, Egyptian, they have uh, been defeated terribly. But look at how they, fought, uh, how they boasted. So as we look at this, we also need to be careful not to allow ourselves to fall into a false confidence and make God laugh at us. I don't know, you know, sometimes whether, I don't know whether you are aware that you know, by our foolish pride, God may be laughing at us. But verse 10, but despite the enemy's boasting, you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sang like lead in the mighty waters. So it's futile to fight with the Lord. And verse 11, very important. But uh, who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. You stretch out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemies. Okay, so we just read a song. Sang to who? Again, I mentioned, sang to the Lord. And so one thing we must notice about Moses' praise, Moses' song, one very important thing that we must apply to ourselves today is also the song is sang to the Lord. Not a word is mentioned about what Moses had done, what Aaron had done, what the Israelites had done. So it was, <clears throat> so it was the Lord who heard the enemies, the Egyptians, into the sea. Not Moses, not Aaron. So in fact, you know, a lot of people, if you are the Israelites, you may think very highly of Moses and Aaron. And usually, if uh, people people will look up to spiritual leaders, right? Because being the leader, they were perceived as very uh, powerful. Their words count and their words carry weight. But despite Moses and Aaron having that kind of authority in the eyes of the Israelites, you notice that even, even Aaron and Moses, they should be worshipping God rather than becoming the object of worship. And so uh, we need to be very careful that as we testify for God, as we praise God, we need to be very mindful to divert all our attention to the glory of God. You know, sometimes people in their enthusiasm to testify for God, they end up uh, pointing to themselves, you know, how smart I am, how I do a lot of things in a short time. But we need to learn to divert attention away from ourselves and to God. And so... <clears throat> Sometimes people may praise us and, oh, you know, you, you're so good in teaching your children or you're so good with your work. You're so good with uh, teaching Sunday school or whatever. But whatever pe people praise us with, the important thing for us is we need to learn to point everyone to the glory of God. And so we see that Moses' song, one very important thing is it is God-centered. And it talks about God's power, God's majesty, God's deeds. You cannot find anything, you cannot find any praise about human deeds, human needs, human desire, or human works. And so, Lincoln Duncan ever made this observation, which I thought is quite useful to share with you. It's a bit long, but I think, especially for those of us, if you are in the worship team, or if you, are, you know the importance of worshipping and singing to God, this is something important, because Lincoln Duncan, he made this, he said this, one of the big differences between a traditional hymn and a gospel hymn is, is what? Is that a gospel song oftentimes focuses on what? On our experiences. <clears throat> Whereas hymns are intentionally God's word. So we need to say what? The focus of the hymn is to give praise to God. Meaning to let the singer focus upon the nature, the person, the action, the promises of God. But this is different 
from the gospel song because the gospel songs, on the other hand, often what meditate upon our own experience. They talk about the benefit of the Lord to us. They talk about our experience of God. But then you ask ourselves, if the song is being composed based on our experience of God, is it right? I mean, sometimes people say, it's correct, what? I feel God love me. But what if oftentimes, you know, along the way we know as Christians, a lot of times the truth is God loves us, but we don't feel His love. A lot of times, in fact, God never left us. God is with us, but we feel He's very distant. So how can we compose songs based on our experience? It's not, it's not accurate, our feeling, our experiences. And so that's why you notice that even though our English service, we have more younger, younger crowd, we still uh, insist on singing traditional hymns because indeed, although I also recognize the, the tune of contempor temp contemporary songs are more catchy, but then it's very hard to find the depth of the lyrics in traditional songs. And so we need to uh, still adhere to the importance of the singing contents. And so the first thing is singing is all about God, nothing about men. And second, we need to note the importance of singing. Uh, so this is uh, why you know you see that every service, whether it's the Chinese service, the English service, we all have singing. In fact, whether we like it or not that day to sing, to have the mood to sing, to sing. You know, some people say this today I don't have any mood to sing. But you realize that the fact that singing is involved, included in the worship order, is so as to remind us that we believers we absolutely have the reason to praise God and our God is worthy to be praised. And, you know, songs have this power. I don't know whether you have um, tasted the effect of songs. You know, sing singing and songs have the effect of tuning our heart to God. You know, sometimes uh, as I was preparing the sermon before uh, in, the, in the small room, you know, usually, I mean, those of you, you didn't preach, you don't know it's very stressful. You think it's very easy because it's a weekly affair or, but, you know, sometimes we feel very stressed. But as I was sitting in the small room, I sing your, I hear your sing the, the music. It actually calms, calms my heart. And sometimes when we are in the congregation, we may feel very dull. We, we may feel there's no reason to praise God. But as we start to sing, you know, the Holy Spirit works through that song, that music, that congregational singing to turn our eyes again to God. So it is important to sing to God. And notice when Moses sang in this praise in Exodus 15, he also used I. He used the personal pronoun, I, a lot. He said, I will sing. I will praise. And so, meaning to say, you know, we must not just enjoy congregational singing, but we, God also loves our private praising, our personal singing to Him. You know, some people, they... They like to sing in a congregation. I don't know. I don't know why. Maybe because they feel they sound very good. They want to tell everyone they have a good voice. So they like to sing in congregation. Or they are very aroused by the high atmosphere. But strangely, when they are alone, they don't find any reason to sing to God. They don't have any desire to praise God. So that is very, that's a very strange phenomenon. But you know, when we talk about singing, some people will say, I, uh, I'm very shy to sing, you know, I don't want, it's not that I don't want to sing, but I feel I sound very awful, I don't like to sing. If that's the case, then we must honestly reflect that if God has done so much for us, does it hurt to praise Him a little bit? You know, I was, uh, you know sometimes it may be true, we may not sound good, because not all of us are musically trained. But even if we are not, uh, our voice may not be the best, we need to think about it. If we feel embarrassed to sing to God with our awful voice, but have you ever remembered that Jesus, he's not embarrassed to die humiliated on the cross for us. So when we think about that, what's there to be so shy, you know, to sing to God? I mean, are we being too high and mighty before God to say, God, I refuse to sing to you? And so of course, when I say it's important to sing and when I quote all this reason, it's not to stress you into singing later. I mean, so, but the thing is, we need to also recognize that singing is what? Singing is actually a very natural reaction. You don't have to force yourself. You know, if you are happy, if you are thankful, you naturally will be able to hum along, you know, sing. So we are just trying to say that if we are truly touched by the grace of God, 
then singing to God, praising God should be a natural thing. We don't even need to force ourselves. But on the other hand, if you find yourself so hard to sing to God, then we need to ask ourselves this question. Do we, are we really touched by the grace of God? So singing is important. And then, and also importantly, the third thing about singing is we, we must not just sing only when you know, the problems are gone. You know, a lot of times people say, wait, wait, wait. I will sing to God. I will praise God like the Israelites after the problem is solved, after there's no more troubles. But I mean, of course, it is easy. It's the most common sense to praise God when all the problems are resolved. But then, that's why just now I say we need to learn to praise God. We also need to learn to praise God all the time. But when I say this, people will say, what's there to praise God when I'm suffering? And that is really a valid and true question. But the thing is, the Bible tells us that even when we are in the midst of trials, we can sing what? We can sing for the future. Well, we, we may not be able to sing for the now because every trial is painful or every pa discipline is painful. But we can sing for the future. What's going to happen in the future? Jesus is going to come again. And when Jesus is coming again, that means what? That means there will be an end to our suffering. We will not suffer forever. And when Jesus comes again, God promises that you know uh, our problems are just light and momentary. But we can exchange this for the eternal glory in Christ. And by then, we will be able to see God face to face in glory. And we will be able to enjoy eternal bliss in Christ. So isn't that something for us to sing about for the future? I mean, now times may not be easy. It may be tough. But we can sing about what God is going to do in the future. And so just now I mentioned, when Moses praised God, he talked all about God. So today let's look into what Moses praised God for. So Moses said, the Lord is my strength. He has become my salvation. Now, I believe uh, if you still recall one of the Exodus message, the Lord actually told the Israelites, you must be still and watch how I fight for you, Israel. But now that God has given them the victory, they cannot keep quiet anymore. So they should sing to God. And so in the same way, that's you know, the Israelite story. But what about us? You know, for, for us, when we read this Exodus story, we'll find it very common sense. Naturally, the Israelites will praise God. But how about for us? Do we realize that God has done something even better for us than helping the Israelites cross the Red Sea? Because if we truly understand how Christ has reversed our faith, meaning Christ has saved us from eternal uh, damnation, Christ has turned our faith from one who is cursed into one who is blessed. Now, if we realize the magnitude of that grace of Christ, then shouldn't we have more reason to sing to God than the Israelites have. And so just now Moses said, God has become my salvation. So if you, know, if you look at the Israelites, the kind of salvation that they receive from God right now is just very temporal, earthly kind of salvation. They are just being saved from an earthly tyrant earthly oppressor and they are just saved from some temporary problem because after the Red Sea they are going to meet other giants in life but just by being saved from this lesser problem they are able to praise God so not to mention for us the kind of grace that we receive from God is it greater than them ours is eternal blessing eternal grace and ours is something that cannot be reversed because when God saves us he will make sure his salvation is effectual and so it would be strange for us to, to remain silent after receiving such great grace from God. And so today we need to ask ourselves, are we able to sing that the Lord is our strength? Now when I ask this question, I want you to reflect on two levels. I mean, usually when people encourage others, you know, the Lord is your strength. Usually it's at which kind of moments that people will encourage someone else with this, the Lord is your strength. Usually, it's when the person is weak, right? Maybe the person is sick. Maybe the person has troubles at work. Maybe the person has international, uh, interpersonal relationship issues. Or maybe the person is dealing with a crisis. And then that's why we always use this term. You know, the Lord is your strength. And yes, it is true that being Christians, we also will face heartbreaking encounters. We also have crises and troubles. But we need to confirm that in those moment of hardship, do we really experience 
God strengthening us, God strengthening our heart, God giving us the, the, the resources and the spiritual power that we need. So this is something we need to confirm. In our moments of weakness, in our moment of problem, can we really taste that the God is our strength? So this is one of the first questions we need to ask ourselves when we think about God being our strength. But the second important question and a lesser asked question is what? Can we say the same? Can we say that the Lord is my strength, our strength, when we are strong, when we, when we can handle all our problems, when we can solve everything on our own? Now, we need to, we need to reflect. Isn't the moments of our uh, strength, when we feel strong ourselves, isn't those moments that is most tempting for us to think that, eh, the Lord is not my strength. My IQ is my strength. My social network is my strength. My eloquence, my people skill is my strength. So actually, we also need to ask this same question. Can we say that the Lord is our strength even when we seem to get everything under control ourselves? Because we need to recognize that the wisdom to handle everything also comes from God. But often we forget the Lord is my strength when we are strong. Because we don't really seem to need God's strength when we are strong. So this is important. When whether we are weak or whether we are strong, we should be singing, the Lord is my strength. And so, so, so when we ask this question, or we, when we keep reflecting, the Lord is my strength, it will actually boost our confidence when we are shaken by problem. But at the same time, when we keep confirming and praising God for being our strength, it will also keep our pride in check. You know, to, to remind ourselves that no matter how smart or how outstanding I am, my strength comes from God. So this is the first thing that Moses mentioned about God. My, the Lord is my strength. He has become my salvation. And next, Moses' song also described God as what? Moses' song also tells us that the Lord is a warrior. Now, warrior is also a man of war. Now, do you like this kind of descri description about God? Do you like that God is a man of war? I mean, the answer depends on whether God is warring for you or against you, right? I mean, we, also, we all know that if God is so mighty, if anyone is in God's back books, that person is going to be overthrown, overpowered, and that person is doomed, right? So a lot of times when people read this, the Lord is a warrior. People like to what? use this verse, use this statement to say that, hey, you know, God is a warrior. The Lord fights for you to defeat your enemy. You know, we, like to, you know, we like to think this about God. You know, God is a warrior. He fights and he, and he wins. So he will defeat all our enemies. Now, is that right or wrong? Maybe yes, maybe no. It depends on whether your enemies is the same as God's. Because oftentimes you realize our own enemy are sometimes not God's enemy. Because a lot of times we actually treat those people whom we should love strangely as our enemy. You know, for example, some brother or sister in Christ, by right, we should love them. But we just can't, cannot stand them or they irritate us. Then we, we, we just treat them as our enemy. But they are not the en enemies of God. So it's different. You know, sometimes because of our human selfishness or sinful nature, our enemy, we wrongly define our enemy. But here, the Lord is a warrior. He's a man of war, meaning he will fight who? Those who oppose him. Just like verse 7, he opposed the Pharaoh. And, you know, so uh, many people's idea of God is what? You know, if you ask people, who do you think God, how do you think God is like? You know, a lot of people would think that God should be like a loving grandfather kind, you know, like Santa Claus, loving grandfather kind. But they don't like God to be a God who likes to fight, a God who appears to be violent. So people don't like an angry God. And if you think about this, it's a, so. but the thing is, just now in verse 7, you notice that Moses actually praised God for what? For his wrath. I mean, just like sometimes you, you, you praise your parents, right? Usually you praise your father, your mother during Father Day, Mother Day. Thank you for loving me. Do you thank them for being angry with you? Or thank you for beating me with the cane the other day? Thank you for being angry with me? I mean, usually people thank God or praise God because he's loving, because he's gracious. 
very rarely, almost, in, almost none, will you hear people praising God for his wrath. But here, the, uh, Moses actually say that, you know, God unleashed his burning anger and he consumed his enemies like a stubble. And so God is praised for his wrath. And we find it strange that, you know, nowadays, especially today in modern society, we hear that many people today love to talk about what? Justice in the world. You know, people make a lot of noises when they see things are unfair, when they have a, when they have a position to raise. They are very angry, you know, when they see that things are not right in this world. So they themselves can be very noisy, be very angry about their own cause. But when it comes to God being angry with sinners, God punishing sinners, God uh, sending sinners to hell, wow, they cannot take it. They cannot accept it. So this is very strange, you know, because people tend to think that uh, if God is loving and good, then God must not be angry, even angry towards sinner or angry towards sin. They think that God should be forgiving, God should pardon everyone rather than execute judgment on people. So we need to think, I don't know whether you have any issue with uh, God's wrath, but if any one of us here, if you have a problem with God's wrath, that means what? That means, so if you have an issue with God being angry about sin, that means we have actually underestimated human goodness. Why? Because if anyone thinks that God shouldn't be angry with sinners, that means the underlying assumption of that person is, mankind is so good. You know, we are all so innocent. We are all so kind-hearted. Why has God, why must God take an issue with all the nice mankind? So if we think God cannot be an angry God, cannot have the righteous wrath, we're actually saying that man is super good. There's no reason for God to be angry. So the thing about us, uh, we are quite biased because Usually we like very serious and severe judgment to be met out to what? To people who hurt us or people who have done wrong or make our life difficult. But when the justice is being done on us, then we don't like it. We don't like that. We don't like justice to come upon us. So we need to realize that the Bible reminds us that God is a warrior. And why does the Bible... Uh, need to give uh, tell us this kind of scary thing. No? Why? Why must the Bible remind us that the Lord is a warrior? Because the Bible always wants to remind us to fear God. Yes, God is love. God is um, nice and kind. But we need to fear God. Uh, and so, so when we talk about God is a warrior, we also need to be careful. You know, When we say that God is a warrior, we're not saying that God being an a warrior is the only description about God. Now, if you, if you think like that, you're also on the bias and skilled side. Of course, God is not just a warrior. He's also love. He's also holy. He's also grace and righteous. But we must be careful because if we reject the idea that God is a warrior, then at the same time, we are also saying that God will not punish those who offend him. And then by saying that, we actually turn God into what? A very soft-hearted, very weak-willed person whom what we can step all over. You know, We just ignore God, don't care about his commandments. Anyway, he don't punish, he won't be angry. So we must, not, um, we must not put God down in that manner. And so when God is a warrior, it means that he will make everyone who oppose or who violate his righteousness and holiness pay for their sin. And so why is it that God is a warrior is such an important truth? Because if God has no righteous wrath, it means what? There is no value in the sacrifice of Christ. Now, if God is a God who will not be angry with sin, then Christ died for nothing. Then there's no need for Christ to die. And Christ is silly to die. But the thing is, sin will be punished. God will be angry with, with sin. And that's what made Christ's uh, cross and blood so precious to us because Christ actually sacrificed for us to take away God's dreadful wrath. So God's wrath can be a blessing to those he loves because as we read for the case of the Egyptian, in God's wrath, God crushed the enemies who opposed his people. And so although it's not nice to hear that God uh, has anger, uh, but our comfort is what? 
God's wrath is praiseworthy because God's wrath is unlike human wrath. You know, what kind, what kind of wrath is human wrath? You know, human wrath, you just think about yourself when you're angry. You know, sometimes we lose our sense. We forgot what's the important thing. We just, we just lose control. You know, human wrath is often out of control, senseless, selfish, random, and very biased. But God's wrath, thankfully, is not like this. You know, God is not petty or temperamental like human wrath. Because if you notice, before God unleashed his anger on the Egyptian, God is extremely patient with them, right? God is extremely patient with the Pharaoh. It's not as if, you know, the Pharaoh only defied God one time and then God drowned all his whole army or killed all their firstborn. No, God patiently waited 10 times. But the Pharaoh repeatedly rejected God and that's why he unleashed his wrath. So we really thank God, you know, that God, although he has wrath, He's also extremely patient. You know, for us, we have wrath. Sometimes we cannot even hold our anger for a minute. We just unleash it immediately. But God, He's a gracious God. And so we praise God for His righteous wrath, but we praise God even more for what? That despite Him being offended by our sin, despite Him being angry with our sin, He still sent His Son and used the blood of His Son to pacify His own wrath so that we can be safe and be reconciled to God. That's how much we should praise God for. Even you know, So it's like, you no, know, you are angry, but you still, so if you are the angry person, you will usually wait for person, the other party to make amends to you. But God is not the case. He is angry himself and he made amends himself so that we can be reconciled to him. So he is indeed worthy of our praise. And so God has the double power to save and to judge. And so we need to take God seriously. And so, importantly, the next point, when Moses continued to praise God, he mentioned something very important. He says, who among the gods is like you? Verse 11. And so one important thing we need to note for Moses' praise and something we should apply to our life is what? Moses, I ask you, is Moses only praising God for one victory, one event, or praising God for the, as a whole person? You know, sometimes we tend to praise God for one event. You know, God, thank you, I found my dream job. God, thank you, I found my dream girl or boy. Or God, thank you, I finally gave birth to my precious one. You know, we tend to thank God for one thing, one event. Wow, we are so happy that God fulfilled our desire for that matter. But the amazing point about Moses' song here is he is not just praising God for one successful victory in the Red Sea event. But if you look at the, if you read back your Bible, Moses is praising God for who he is. Moses is praising God as a whole person. You know, that's why he said, who is like you? Majestic in holiness. No. Awesome in glory. Working wonders. No. Is God only holy and awesome one time? Or when he opened the Red Sea, he's only awesome during that moment? Or is God holy and awesome all the time? Even when they are in the desert? Even when they are wandering 40 years in the desert, you know, in the harsh weather, but they are given food, they are being protected, they are footwear, everything. God is holy and awesome all the time, not only during one event. And so, in this praise song, one thing we need to learn is, we need to learn to praise God for who He is. Because the event that we encounter in our life will change, right? Uh, today you feel like God gave you a, uh, fulfill your dream, your event is good. Another day you feel the encounters in your life are not so good, but still God is holy, God is awesome, God is majestic. And so this song highlights one important thing, and that thing is in fact the whole theological summary of Exodus. Now if you don't know, Exodus is very, I mean it's a very, it's a very long book, right? So, But what is the key point of the whole book of Exodus is, listen, God is incomparable with other so-called gods. So this is what uh, God has been trying to emphasize over and over again in the book of Exodus. So if you can recall you know, some of the verses that we have read before, in the book of Exodus, God repeatedly told the Israelites, God also repeatedly told the Egyptian what? Then you will know that I am the Lord. So God did a lot of things. God opened the Red Sea. God sent the plagues. God killed the firstborn. God performed miracles. God did a lot of things to emphasize one point. There is only one God. 
Who is like you? Who among the gods is like you, Lord? So the Egyptians, they worship many gods. Maybe the Israelites are also tempted to worship other things. But God has been trying to emphasize to the Egyptians and to the Israelites alike that there is only one God. And so this is the point. This is the point that the book of Exodus is trying to drive. Whoever trusts in this only God will be blessed. Whoever rejected this only God will be cursed, like the Pharaoh. So that's the main point of the book of Exodus. There's only one God. No one compares to him. Blessed are the ones who trust in him. And so we realize that you know Moses, he said, who is like you? You are holy beyond comparison. And so we need to recognize that. Uh, but even in the Red Sea event, God shows himself to be holy. Because holy means what? Holy means set apart, being different. No other God can open the Red Sea like God. So God is without equal, meaning to say, no matter how much we want to praise Him, it can never be enough. We can use our whole heart to praise Him. We can praise Him every day. It's still not enough to give Him the praise, the kind of level of praise that God is due. That's how praiseworthy God is. And so uh, Moses reminds us that there is no other person, no other object of praise that we should have. And finally, when we praise God, you know, it's not just to give thanks for the past, but praising God has another effect. Now, when you praise God, you realize that you don't just trigger your gratitude toward God, but when you praise God, you actually find confidence in your path ahead also. Because when we start to praise God, we start to gain confidence that God will also help us in the future, whatever comes. So the thing about this Exodus chapter 15 is, if you look at this whole chapter, the first 12 verses actually praise God for the past, you know, uh, past grace, how he has hurt the Egyptian into the sea. But from verse 13 to 18, it actually praise God's what? Future faithfulness. So let's read Exodus chapter 15 verse 13. Okay, here, in, <clears throat> in your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. You realize that from verse 13 onwards, it's all the future tense, will, will, will. So, in verse 14, the nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. So here, the nations refers to what? If you know the Israelite story, you know, right? After crossing the Red Sea, as they are going to conquer the promised land, the Israelites is going to meet a lot of different nations, right? Uh, before they, they can take over the promised land. So these nations, before the Israelites, so later on when you read uh, the Bible, you, you will see that some of the nations, before Israelites even invaded them, they already tremble because they heard about the wonderful deeds of God. So the nations will hear and tremble, and Guish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. And the people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. And by the power of your arm, they will be as still as a stone. Until your people pass by, Lord, until the people you bought pass by. And so this is... This is a prophecy that you know God will faithfully lead his people into the promised land. Just as how God has faithfully guided his people away from the Egyptian, God will also help them safely reach the promised land. And you will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance. The place, Lord, you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. And important is verse 18. The Lord reigns forever and ever. So he's king forever. And because God is eternal, how we respond to God, whether we accept God or whether we reject God, it has eternal consequences. Okay, so this is the praise about God's future faithfulness. Then verse 19 to 21 is very fast. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the, the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and river he has heard into the sea. So he's, she's repeating essentially what Moses just praised God, meaning to say whether it's brother or sister, they all praise God 
for the same thing. And so here, as we read, as we read the second half of the book of uh, of Exodus chapter fifteen, you realize that the Israelites they could find confidence in God because they have seen how God is faithful to them in saving them from the hands of the Egyptian. So they will know that God will also not fail them when they encounter giants in the promised land. So how about you and I? You know, for we New Testament Christians, God also reminds us of this important principle that because of what God has done for us in the past, we have future we have assurance in God's future, uh, future faithfulness to us also. And that's why you hear Apostle Paul, he, encar he encouraged us with a similar message. Similar message of how the God who is faithful in the past will be faithful to us in future. Okay, so Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Okay, this is a very familiar verse, right? What then shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So you see the similarity? You know, in Moses' song, he's trying to highlight that if God has been so faithful to save the Israelites from the Red Sea, from the Pharaoh, God will be faithful to lead them into the Promised Land. Paul here is saying the same thing. If God has even given us his precious son, one and only son, what other things less precious than his son will he not give us? So based on what God had already done in giving us his son, we can have assurance that in our days ahead, whatever we encounter, God will be faithful to us. And who will bring any charge, charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justified. And so here we see that indeed God is faithful once and he will continue to be faithful. And just now in responsive reading, I don't know whether you recall, we even read uh, this another song, uh, another song of Moses in Revelation chapter 15. Just now we read already. That song is about, you know, during the end times when the final last seven plagues was poured upon the earth, God will also defeat his enemies. And then, his people will sing to him. So Revelation chapter 15, verse 1 to 4, from there you see another song. So it means to say that God, he will reign forever and ever. He not just reign once. He not just defeat the Pharaoh one time. But God will continue to have victory all the way to the end of the age. So now the important question for us is this. If the Bible tells us that the Lord reigns forever and ever, then we need to ask, is God reigning in your heart, in our heart, right now? So this is an important question. You know, we like the Israelites, we have seen God's works, we have tasted God's grace, we have read God's promises and God's word. But does seeing all these things, does reading the word of God, hearing his promises, tasting his grace, make us want to yield to God as the king and master of our life? So this is our prayer. Now, after we hear this praise song, we need to pray that God help us to make him the only king in our lives. And God wants and God must be the only king in our life. And that's why if you recall, uh, somewhere later in the book of Old Testament, you know, there's a point where the Israelites actually demanded Samuel, prophet Samuel for a king. And Samuel was so upset. In fact, God was upset because by asking Israel, by asking God, by asking, okay, by asking Samuel to give them a king, the Israelites are trying to say that, no, we don't want God as our king. We want a human, presentable God like all other nations. And that's why God is upset with their folly. And later on, if you read the Bible, they pay a price for choosing to trust in human king over God as their king. So we need to, then when we come back to the, case of Exodus, you realize the case of Exodus, we always talk about the story of Exodus being what? Being a tug of war between the Pharaoh and God. So the, the Exodus story is actually also about what? About who is the king of your life, about kingship. You know the Pharaoh? The Pharaoh wants to be the Israelite's king. The Pharaoh wants the Israelite to serve him. Now, it could be anything today, you know, it could be money wants to be your king. 
or you know any other idols want to be your king. But it's a talk of war between this Pharaoh versus the real king, God. God also wants to be Israel's king. And the good thing about God is what? He is a good king. He's not like the Pharaoh. When we say that God is a good king, we mean to say that God thinks about our benefit. You know, God, God sacrificed himself to save us. And so God is different from all other human kings. If you think about it, usually human kings, they will want their subject to what? To serve them, to pay tribute, pay tax to them, to serve them, to uh, die for them. But God is different. God, he gives his whole person. He sacrificed himself for us. So God is, yes, God wants to be our king, but he is a good king. And we praise God for wanting us to be his people. And so we need, to, uh, we need to know when God wants to save us from our enemies, from his enemies, God is not just wanting to reconcile us to him, but God not just save us from sin, God also wants us to partake in his blessing, partake in his divine nature, to be holy like him. So when we, when we recap what a wonderful God is, can we still say, there is no reason for us to sing praise to God. So this is one thing we, we need to ask our heart is, is there really no reason for us to thank God and sing praise to Him today? So now we need to ask ourselves, then what are you usually singing about nowadays? Are you frequently singing praise about yourself? Wow, you know, my children are so obedient, so well behaved. Or you are singing praises about the world. You know, the world is so advanced. The world is such a nice place. Or you are singing most of the time about God's praises. So this is the question we need to ask ourselves. We also need to double check whether we can only sing about God's love. Or can we also praise God for his wrath? Because we know that when God's um, angry with sin, it means for us to fear him and shun evil. So may God teach us today, as what we read just now, to sing and make music from our heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for today's message. Lord, indeed, you are most worthy of praise. Lord, uh, please open our eyes because a lot of times we are blinded to your wonderful grace. A lot of times we take your grace for granted. But today as we hear your word, we pray that you will touch our hearts again so that we will appreciate your love, even your wrath, and we will be committed to follow you faithfully all the days of our life because we know that you have been faithful to us and you will keep on being faithful to us. And Lord, we thank you and we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.